I'm yeah, so I'm forty. I'm, I'm forty nine. So we're coming thirty. We're happy anniversary. Yeah. Forty nine too. So. Yeah, because we would have been George Brown College. In our twenties. Yeah, I was there at, when I just turned nineteen. Yeah, so we've known each other about thirty, 30 years. Thirty plus years. It's pretty. I cool. think that's a nice way to start talking about how you guys know each other. Yeah, sure. How do you want us to begin, though? Well, I mean, considering that I'm I'm already beginning. Sure. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> we just dive in. So I think for about 15 years, I knew a guy also named Bob. So oh the story. This is incredible. So every time we would go out, there would be Neil and Bob. So it just <laughs> always was great. <laughs> I remember that introduction, too. Neil. Bob. Bob. Bob Neil. That's exactly Neil it. and Bob. Oh, like, oh it's wonderful. <laughs> So that would have been 2003 that started. Um, I think that joke's way older than that. Oh, well, well technically, 20 years, it's, it's been going on. Yeah. Okay. And I still know Bob. He still knows okay, Neil. well, we'll have and him still, on next time. He exactly. still knows, knows Neil. Yeah, well, uh, you guys have done a good job kind of introducing yourselves. You guys, whoever watched my channel, know Neil. We've been talking for a while, various topics. But today, we introduce... Uh, the new friend to myself, Brad Thorpe, the inventor of ISOFIT. Um, for those in the isometric strength training world, Brad is sort of the guru, if I may say. Uh, and Brad introduced ISOFIT in 2015. Yep. And uh, a meteor meteoric rise in popularity, would you say? Uh, we've been adopted by some pretty awesome people. Right? Yeah, why don't... I'd rather you just tell me oh, who, man. because like um, when I see the army and FBI, I mean, we got some pretty awesome clients. So yeah, yeah. so the U.S. Army. The Are FBI. you even you even allowed to say it? Um, technically, I'm not sure. I do. <laughs> I'm sure um, it's fine. You know, we don't go into numbers and quantities and purchases and really what we do with them. But yeah, you know, a bunch of years ago, I got an email from the U.S. Army saying they were interested in what we were doing. I thought it was a complete hoax. I was going to yeah. ask you. If uh, I got an email like that, I'd I probably... Did, I didn't, honestly, I didn't believe it was true. I kind of, when I phoned them, I'm like, um, we would just argue, ar arbitrarily say the guy's name's Steve, Colonel Steve. And I was like, Colonel, Steve. Colonel Steve, sure? Yeah, <laughs> really, come on. He was pulling my leg, but yeah. So U.S. Army, um, so, you know, they were a client. Um, then the FBI was a referral, which was great. Um, From the Army? No, Stipe Milocic, um, the UFC oh. heavyweight champion. Oh. His, his trainer was my pitch man to get us into the FBI. A I guy know. named Bobby Khalil out of Cleveland, which is, uh, you know, he's truly an amazing man. And he heads up a, uh, the, the sports performance side of a thing, uh, organization called Spire, which is a uh, student academy and for high performance, but it also functions as a U.S. Olympic training facility in Geneva, Ohio. It's wow. uh, almost an 800,000 square foot facility. It is the most massive training facility I have ever seen. Yeah. And just absolutely incredible human beings that are out of there. So that's how it kind of ended up there. And then we're broken into Hollywood. So we're just deemed Hollywood's newest celebrity workout by Shape, Mag Shape? Shape. Shape Magazine, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, so people like um, Zoe Saldana, she sure. uses it. Um, Diane Any of Ross, the other guardians? Um, mm -hmm. No, not that I know of anyway. Yes. Yet. And the key is yet. Right. Um, you know, we, we are very per pervasive in the sense that once people start using ISOFIT, they start to tell people. And sure. we're very, very fortunate. So we don't really, um, I don't spend really any money on marketing. It's just all the word of mouth because it's really hard to captivate, you know, pushing into something that doesn't move. Like there's really no way you can sexy it up. We've tried um, outside of, hey, look at the result. And just yeah. have other people sort of talk about it, which is great. And how we ended up in Hollywood was the head strength coach for the Cleveland Cavaliers told his buddy yeah, and showed his buddy. So Derek Millinder, who happens to be the world championship uh, strength coach for the Cavs, uh, was my pitch man for that side of it. So we end up with the FBI for the UFC heavyweight uh, trainer to the heavyweight champ. And then we end up with the, uh, you know, Hollywood because of uh, this guy named Derek Millinder. That's you know, great. It, it, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and it's a testament to what we've created and more so the fact that people want to be involved with it because the results, I mean, you look at across from a scientific perspective, 
There's ample evidence about isometrics. And then from a just a practical result perspective, people are just tired of being hurt with general exercise. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we were talking a little bit about the, I guess, the contrast of isometrics and uh, maybe the impetus be- behind you like so seeing a problem with regular exercise. And so when someone's like wondering what ISOFIT is doing, like why is it important? Why is it revolutionizing training? What's like the most direct way that you would explain it? So simplest way to define it to, let's go to the lay person. We're teaching people how to contract muscle without movement, right? So it's like literally you're pulling into something that doesn't move. And the isofit, I mean, if, if I really sort of say what it is, it's a fancy wall that I can put in the middle of a room. So I have a, an object that I can pull into that's going to restrain movement, right? It's no different for me using this wall behind me if I want to do like external rotation because I know we're doing some videotape here. Um, so if I'm just pulling out, it's going to happen. I'm going to work the muscles on the backside of my arm. If I pull into a table and press down, it's going to work on the muscles underneath. Um, So it's just a super easy way to teach people how to contract muscle first before you add the complexity of movement, right? So that's one of the things. And what we as an industry have um, blatantly failed, the consumer, and to be honest, most of the industry professionals as well, um, we've been focused so much on movement we forgot there's a named muscle contraction called isometric. That's how important it is. We actually named one of three different movement paths. A gave it a name and said, okay, well, if I'm learning how to contract a muscle before I move into the concentric or the eccentric realm, well, you have to have an upregulation of isometric muscle tension. There's no way around it. It's the, 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 the function of muscle is you, have an isometric contraction first, and that's within the first 50 milliseconds. And then you have tension placed on the tendon structure, and that tendon becomes stiff or rigid. And then that helps transmit that force to the bone. So you then have the choice of, do I want to move? Do I want to stay here? Do I just want to create more tension? Or you know, do I want to do a yoga pose? Do I want to jog? Do I want to do whatever I want to do? The marketing term of the activity, uh, to be honest, I don't care what it is. I know I'm going to make you better with our approach to isometric training and we see it across the board. So when someone is, I guess, hardwired and they're thinking of what exercise is supposed to look like, um, what is the easiest way for you to explain? It's like, but this is why it's wrong. And this is why what I'm suggesting is different, better, more effective. Um, the easiest way to navigate that. And it, it that's a lot land my mind feel basic. Sure. Um, I usually no longer try to tell people what they're doing is wrong. It's like, how do we navigate this conversation? And before and off, off air, we were talking about how I used to be antagonistic. I'd want to challenge you. I'd want to fight you. I'd want to make you, you know, kind of really kind of question what you're doing in the sense that it's like, hey, look at the research, look at the injury rates. Um, you know, you look at running as an example. You know, the, the, the research will re- basically tout 30 to 90% of the people are injured by running. So that means if you're going to line up at a race, you know, it's just a Sunday fun 10K, let's call it. Three to nine people out of the next 10 people standing beside you are actually injured by running. So that, that's not healthy in my world. Now, I could sit there and tell you about that, or I could say, hey, how would you like to run better? How would you like to run injury-free? How's that? Um, because now I'm talking to 70% of the, 70 to 90% really of the audience. So how we position ISOFIT is this is how you prepare for movement, right? By upregulating that isometric tension. So getting strong and stable first, and then go work on the marketing term of the activity that you love to do, whether it's gardening, whether it's yoga, whether it's that running scenario we just discussed. If you're not prepared muscularly, if you don't have the tendon stiffness to transmit force throughout your entire body, what will happen is that activity that you love to do will tear you apart. The more you do it, the higher the risk, the higher the injury. And you look at that and go, oh, well, that's not what I want to do. It's like, well, that's the gym industry. That's the running. That's 
ice hockey. I mean, your audience is broad, I'm assuming. Um, so it's all of them, those people that are experiencing injury based on doing the activities that they love to do, we can help you, right? And that's what we lead with. That's far more uh, uh, advantageous than saying, hey, uh, that activity you're going to do is just dumb. It's going to hurt you, right? Right. So in one sense, you are kind of um, educating and teaching and maybe showing a better way of what they're doing through isometrics. Correct. But really... Maybe, maybe peeking behind the curtain, the idea is what that, if it's a sport, if it's versus an exercise versus a lifestyle activity, at what point is the activity you're doing beneficial or leading to an improvement in health versus I just want to be better at hockey or basketball? Because a lot of people play basketball, they don't do it because they want to be healthy, they do it because they enjoy it or it's mm -hmm. their career or whatever. Other people who are like a marathon runner, perhaps, maybe they think that running is their conduit to health. They feel like if I'm able to improve my time, that I'm healthier, stronger, fitter, whatever it may be. So that's where maybe the two conversations diverge in terms of like, okay, if you want to be an athlete, isometrics, isofit will make you better at what you're doing and prevent injury, reduce your risk, as opposed to um, you know, using a type of exercise as this is my my martial arts. This is my expertise. This is what I invest in because I want to be healthier. And maybe you're kind of changing the dialogue in that way. And that's that we are. And it's I'm not saying don't do your activity. I'm saying add this and your activity will become healthier, safer, and more enjoyable. And you'll be able to do it long term. We work with some of the world's elite um, what do you call those MMA athletes and these guys are sacrificing their health for a career you know sure. so if we can help them win more money win more titles win more events that's good when they're done their career we're also there to help them recover from their career right because we have that ability provided that they haven't done too too much damage that we're able to sort of um rebuild the structures in there to help them go into and transition into the next sort of phase of life, right? And you'll sort of see across the board, most people give up high-level athletics by the time they're 30, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You, you do have sort of several outliers, and it's getting more prevalent as training methodologies are getting better. Um, as these athletes are moving away from the, like the traditional strength and conditioning model it's not always about you know bench press squats and deadlifts it's about okay well maybe we need to get stronger in these new ranges of motion um, maybe we need to do all this preventative care versus just sacrifice structure and we fill that gap with all of that stuff with what we do and we see it across the board which is which is absolutely fantastic right but one thing that i want to sort of convey to everyone it, it is the performance side that we, we work on but the amount of health benefit associated with isometrics it literally is the missing link to better health and well-being right? you think of things like hypertension and heart disease and stroke right like the mayo clinic came out in 2014 put out a physician paper in or sorry a paper in their uh, mayo clinic proceedings and what they stated in 2014 was that isometric exercise was superior to cardiovascular training and resistance training for lowering blood pressure in a hypertensive population. Right? There's one point some odd billion people currently dealing with hypertension. Right? And you look at the odds, and down in the United States of America, it's roughly 50% of the adult population has at least type 1 hypertension, if not type 2 hypertension. And it's like, okay, well, if this is the leading way or the best way the superior way to lower blood pressure why isn't everyone talking about this drives me nuts right <laughs> you know and then the british um, medical journal just put out a, or a paper in 2018 that looked at grip strength and they tied it to all kinds of different diseases right different types of cancer um, stroke risk blood pressure issues, hypertension, all this, what they failed to mention in this article was the, the way they actually measure 
grip strength is isometrically, right? Sure. So it's like, okay, well, if we're tying poor isometric strength to a myriad of health crises, once again, why aren't we sort of out there telling everyone we've got caught up in this world of dynamic movement? And, you know, you've heard that expression, movement is medicine, and this drives me nuts. Um, and the reason for that, it really should be contraction. Right? Mm -hmm. It's really about the contraction. You don't need to move. And arguably, by moving when you're ill-prepared, actually accelerates degenerative change. And people look at that and go, but we're going to be better by exercising. Stats don't necessarily indicate that. Yeah, that's pretty. You said so many things. I I, I got to tease Sorry part of that. no. <laughs> don't apologize. In the flow, I knew that was gonna happen. <laughs> in in the flow, there's no. too much stuff in my head. I mean, I I can go all over the place. I mean, the the grip strength in relation to um, risk of disease and and that sort of thing. Is there just thinking outside the box? Is there or have you experienced areas of weakness in an isometric grip versus a nice i mean i i want to learn more of the, uh, the the jargon to understand but can someone have isolated areas of you know, isometric strength versus weakness yes does that ever play into a physiological condition yes. where not necessarily like um you know my shoulder is weak and then yeah um i'm gonna have poor cardio but maybe there's an or organ fun dysfunction physiological, uh, biochemical. So if you think about just, um, so we'll tease this out a little bit. We'll use, use your word because I like that one. Um, so let's say you're looking at your glenohumeral joint, right? So your shoulder joint for everyone that doesn't know what your GH joint is. Um, so what happens is, let's say the muscles aren't causing a certain level of contraction, right? So it has a mass that hangs from your frame, right? Because it's hanging off your rib cage. So if that has a mass to it, and it is under a specific amount of stretch because it doesn't contract properly. The artery is going to narrow. Mm. The vein is going to narrow, right? So you're in, or in effect, you're going to augment blood flow. You're going to put some tissue under potentially an inflammatory crisis, right? Because it's chronically being stretched now. Um, the nutrients are going to be delivered at a different rate because the flow has changed. Right. You then have to think about the other structures, what's happening to the lymph within the area if the muscles aren't working properly. Right. You're going to get like almost like a festering of all this chemical crap that you don't want in there right. that's going to lead to inflammation. Right. And then you know, more into your realm. Sure. Um, and then it's like, OK, well, think of the mechanics of the joint structure as well. If I'm now distracted, like slightly, let's use the word sublux because a lot of people know what that word means. So it's slightly distracted. So if that structure is slightly distracted and I go to move it, well, it's more at risk for pain, right? So there's going to be a little bit more pressure on the nerve structures as well, right? So maybe that signaling becomes impaired because I'm under a chronic stretch. And, sure. we, and we know that stretching leads to usually a reduction of muscle tissue or muscle tension, sorry, or muscle tone. Yeah. Right? So it's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, that stuff we kind of need. And then... We have to look at that and go, what happens if that chronically hangs? Um, what is the influence going to be at your shoulder blade um, and how that moves on your rib cage? You might get a winging of your scapula, which is going to augment, you know, jumping into the neck muscles and stuff like that. Well, how does your upper trap work if your lower portion of your scapula isn't anchored properly, right? So it's a cascading effect mm -hmm. of, hey, I just lacked muscle tension over here. Yeah. You know, it, it really is so interconnected that if you lack isometric muscle strength, and we'll simplify it, everyone out there in the audience, just go and un, like loosen the bolts in your car, just three turns. How does your car function? It's going to feel loose. It's going to be loose. The performance is going to go down. You're going to start to rattle a little bit. Sure. Right. Now we'll throw something really interesting that's never, never, never discussed. And this should be top of mind for everyone over the age of 30, you are going to start to get shorter with age. That means your length tension relationships of your muscle structure are going to come a little bit closer. So that means your ability to generate muscle tension is going to drop off. Remember why there's not many more athletes going beyond 30? It's because they start to get shorter, right? So they're going to lose that step. They're going to lose 
thousands of seconds in their performance. Sure. Right. And when you're dealing with world class elite athletes, a thousandth of a second actually truly matters. So us three, probably not that important today, you know, over time. Yeah. So yeah. So it's some interesting stuff when you start to explore the cascading effect of, hey, this muscle didn't work over here very well. Yeah, it is a rabbit hole. I, I mean, the next thought that came to my mind is uh, the meme of the uh, gamer, the slouched kid. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, can you speak to posture and uh, inactivity in relationship to um, both? You know, it, they look like they're just going to be sickly individuals when they continue to develop that in that state. The data on poor asymmetric strength in adolescence will relate to Parkinson's disease, wow. Alzheimer's disease, hypertension, which leads to heart disease and stroke. And there's um, basically a Swedish heart health study that was done over 35 years of one point, was it 1.1 million people? Um, and they basically just sort of looked at it and said, hey, um, the the one major risk factor was poor isometric muscle strength, right? It didn't matter if you're obese. It didn't matter if you had pre-existing conditions. Didn't even matter if you smoked. What they found was well, you're more likely to have these other sort of confounding or these other issues, void of the confounding factors, was poor isometric strength. And then you just to jump into all these other studies, they're linking it to depression anxiety, all these things. But if you're not held together properly and you're going to have joints not moving properly, flow dynamics um, becomes impaired. The flow dynamics becomes impaired. Well, that's just more stress internally in the entire system. Sure. Right. So that's once again going to cascade into, oh, I don't feel confident. I don't, I don't like the way I look. I don't like the way I move. When I move hurts, you know, maybe, you know, I got some health issues. Well, what can you do to resume, re, like basically um, create better levels of tension within your structure? Are you going to go run on a treadmill when you you already have too much stress in your life versus I'm just going to learn how to contract muscle, get strong, get stable, then move. Sure. Right. So we're basically the prequel to movement. Well, I mean, that's a nice segue to the ISOFIT, like your patent patents and the um, I, I guess the apparatus, the main apparatus that I kind of see on your, your Instagram and, and on your website, can you speak to like the, the concept there, what it's functionally doing, what's it providing, like how do you, how do you use it? Um, so the, the one you normally see on Instagram is the Isofit strength kit. So that's our portal or smaller unit. And um, we came out a couple of years ago, back in 2015 with the Isofit strength trainer, which I mean, to be honest, it's probably the best um, motion restraint device ever created. Um, you know, pat myself on the back for that. I mean, it, it really restrains all human joint motion. So that's a lot of different things it can do. But with the, the MS or the uh, mobile strength kit, um, basically what that was designed for was a very, very simplistic, uh, uh, apparatus to restrain movement so and for you guys that um, i recommend you go check it out on our instagram page uh, just so you see it and we'll give you the, the details in this sort of notes at the bottom uh -huh. um, but if you sort of look at it it basically is a motion restraint device and what we fail to recognize in the world of resistance training or gym like using selectorized equipment is kind of like well why did you put a weight in your hand right you know it's really to resist motion so with ISOFIT, it's just a really simple way to resist all human joint motion, um, you know, and so it can be as complex as you want it to be, or you can simplify it and say, hey, just push into that or pull into that, you know, to work a specific muscle. And, and if you know muscle anatomy, or you have some ideas of what you, if you've done a bench press before, you know how to use ISOFIT. If you've done a squat before, you know how to use ISOFIT. It just doesn't move. But what you're trying to do is recreate these movements that you would have loaded traditionally with a barbell or a weight or a selectorized piece of equipment and we can recreate all of those so and it's it's based off of and this is a kicker newton's third law of motion for mm -hmm. reaction there's an opposite uh, equal and opposite reaction so if i'm pushing into the crossbar on the isofit it's going to respond with me in real time but we always have perfect resistance based off of what that 
individual has on that given day. So if you're tired and you're pushing as hard as you can, that might not be the same load as when you're fully energetic, caffeined up and, you know, on some sort of herbal supplement, you know, and you're pushing way harder, but it'll still match your outputs. Now, the benefit to what we do with Isofit versus a dumbbell, when you're pushing with dumbbells, let's say you're pushing with 100 pounds. Um, so as you fatigue, that 100 pound dumbbell is actually going to get heavier relative to your fatigue state, right? So instead of 100 pounds, you're getting tired. So now it feels like 110, 120, 130, 140, 150 pounds. Okay. With Isofit, if I'm pushing into it, let's say we're going to use that 100 pounds and I start to fatigue, it's going to go to 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40. Right. And I can still push. Mm -hmm. So the interesting side of that is, so I've reduced the level of risk, right? Because that uh, it's a descending load and I can stop at any point in time. But more so what happens is if I'm going and dropping down that 60% from that hundred down to 40 pounds, my perceived exertion, mm -hmm. the 40 pounds is actually my hundred percent effort. Yeah. yeah it's right. Awesome. So it's crazy how you can do that. So things that, we traditionally don't talk about it in the exercise realm is how do you train your tendon structure to get stronger, stiffer, more compliant, right? What we tend to do is go, oh, go lift weights. And oh yeah, 50% of all reported injuries um, across sport and workplace scenarios happen to be the tendon and ligament structure, yeah. right? Not muscle. Yeah. Muscles rarely actually get hurt. They end up sore from doing, you know, less than optimal stuff in a gym. So why do we keep injuring all these ligaments? And why do we keep injuring all these tendons? It's usually because we didn't progress appropriately. We didn't consider the tendon and um, we just overloaded it and we did too many repetitions, which led to inflammation on the structure. So right. would you say those individuals maybe had too much muscular hypertrophy that was in a compromise the tendon or the tendon wasn't strong enough to match it or is it just an inflammation it's it's a combination of all of that um so when you get tendon ruptures i mean if they're a big jack dude it's usually associated with steroid use because yeah. um, the muscle will um, generally get bigger and stronger faster at a faster rate than the yeah. tendon structure also you're looking at the masses they're moving through space and they always get injured on the transitional phase so when they go to whether it's a decelatory perspective where it's like hey i'm now um if i'm negatively accelerating an object so lowering a bench press when i go to go up the mass is still going down as i'm transitioning up so you get that rapid rate of stretch within that tendon structure that's usually when you'll end up with a rupture yeah um, so that's that side ligamentous structure similar scenario and that's where it's that transitional phase from changing direction your mass is going one way as you're trying to go a different direction so that's like usually the root cause of an acl injury or an achilles rupture like that sort of stuff sure so uh with isofit would i be doing a training session like what, what would I expect? W would I be identifying an area of weakness? Would I? Depends on the practitioner truly. Um, so we have pre-skipped programs, which are awesome, um, which is for the general fitness community where we call those 30 and 30. So it's a 30 minute program. You do 30 isometrics in that 30 minutes and it's 10 exercises for your upper body, 10 for your core, 10 for your lower body. And it's a 45 second muscle contraction with a 15 second transition time. And to be honest, we created that program because initially we were very therapeutic mindset where it's like, I'm gonna fix this muscle, right? And it was to the level of nauseum in the sense that I'm going to do, you know, let's say it's your peroneus brevis, right? This is a muscle that controls your ankle right down on the lower leg. And I was like, okay, we can strategically line that muscle up and do that. And for you guys out there, you know, it's a muscle in your ankle. Um, and people said, hey, this is great. This is amazing. I said, it's gr like, I love it. I am so bored yeah. sitting here with you trying to be like this sciencey guru type guy when it's like, yeah, this is great, but I, I just I just can't continue doing this. Um, so there's that aspect of it. So that's why we created the 30 and 30 program where it's like, okay, well, let's make a fun, engaging, highly addictive program and the reason it's highly addictive is people like the results mm -hmm. and more importantly they like not being injured from the traditional exercise mindset so 
How do they feel after uh, that, that training um, session? Euphoric. Um, <laughs> do you feel sore like you had a workout, rarely, the typical? Rarely, because you, you don't have the transitional phase of movement where you have all these traditional, like where normally you would have these um, collision forces. Mm -hmm. So less inflammation, you're going to feel heightened. And if you think about human structure, right? So we have about 640-ish muscles in our body, but we have over 4,000 tendons, Right. We forget that we don't. Well, sorry. We don't know that. And so if tendons are designed to transmit force throughout our structure. Right. We all know that and muscles pull, contract and tendons pull on bone and we create movement. So that's nobody's going to argue that part. But we were always just, um, you know, whether it's in school or not, we were always like muscles are like Tootsie Pops. Or Tootsie Rolls, you have the muscle belly, which is the candy. And then you have at the end, those are the two tendons and those tendons attach to your bone. That's what we were taught. That's in a single muscle scenario. But if you think of your psoas as an example, right? So your psoas is a muscle on the anterior surface of your spine, right? Um, they usually sort of say stretch it because if you sit too long, it gets tight and leads to all these issues. There's nothing but hogwash, to be honest, but a different conversation. But you look at that psoas. So it goes from T12 down to L5. Right, so that's six levels, and then you got your lesser trochanter, which it attaches to, and each segment of your vertebral bodies, you're going to have a different tendon. So that one muscle itself has six or seven tendons, depending on the literature, because some goes up to T11. Um, so you look at that and go, okay, cool. If I'm not training that muscle, right, which would pull that sort of anterior surface of your spine forward in the lumbar region. Maybe you're going to end up with non-specific low back pain because you never trained a muscle that stabilizes that area. So you could sit upright instead of chronically trying to loosen it, loosen it, loosen it, right? Because let's say you want, you, you're going to go for a run. So we'll bring the running community back into this. And I told you to undo your shoelace before you went for a run. You're probably going to look at me and go, well, why would I do that? I go, well, I don't know, but that's kind of like stretching. You know, it's kind of, you're loosening stuff off. Why? You know the names of the tissues you were loosening. So, and I know that opens up a can of worms, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, it is. It is. I mean, because I, I mean, all of this is challenging kind of like what we just envisioned or were brought up on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, I'm thinking of like what someone who does isometrics and isofit, like what would their, what would your um, spokesperson like the if there was a physique that was a character type of what the perfect isometric isofit athlete look like, is it you? No, no. It depends, <laughs> it, it depends on the human, and it depends on what their goals are. Right? Well, I mean, I, I, like for context, like in the seventies and eighties, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and then moving on, those were like the bodybuilders. And then we went through a phase of more of a fitness, but still really ripped and muscular now. And then it went to like the Ronnie Coleman phase of just enormous mass. Mm -hmm. Now, like, poor guy, he's, he can't barely walk well, now. Look at the outcome of what he did. Sure. Right. And he's, he's the epitome of awesomeness for bodybuilding. Right. And you look at what he did when he ended the movie. He went back to doing the same dumb shit that led him into the first, like let him down that road anyways. Sorry to swear on your podcast. <laughs> um, you know, but you look at that. So the ideal is that individual usually has a smile on their face. Okay. And you mentioned euphoria as well. I mean, you're giving me the, the sense. It's like they just feel good. Yeah. And you've probably done this while being drunk at some point in your life. Have you ever heard of the floating arm trick? where you push your arm up against a wall for like 45 seconds, like relatively hard, and then you step away from the wall and your arm floats up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's based off a guy named Oscar Constam. So he died in 1917. So when you're looking at an isometric contraction for a period of about 45 seconds, it actually increases your ability to augment your involuntary muscular system. Meaning you can recreate that whole scenario which floating that feeling of lightness with isofit and that's more than just your shoulder you can do it with your neck muscles provided that the muscles are big enough to lift the mass of the limb that you're looking at so it happens in your legs it happens in your spine structure and you're familiar with that um, the, the basic well you, you have young kids so you probably have some marionettes in your house right so dancing doll with strings right 
So let's look at it this way. So if we say that, you know, Neil over here is a marionette and Neil has 10 muscles and Neil is a hundred pounds, we'll make Neil perfect. We're going to give, you know, for each muscle, they're going to support 10 pounds. Let's say life stress and trauma comes, comes along and cuts three strings. Neil's mass doesn't change. But the working muscles, instead of holding 10 pounds, now go to 14.28 pounds per muscle. So there's a 40% increase or greater than a 40% increase in workload on that structure. So it's going to get tighter. It may hypertrophy or hypertrophy because it's working more. But if I have a nerve root, so let's say I did that for my left side of my trunk, right, my obliques. So they're working and my right side isn't because they were cut due to injury trauma, surgery, whatever it may be. Well, I'm going to naturally laterally flex to that left side, and I might start to squish my organs on that left side. I might sort of compress my nerve roots coming out the spine levels on that side. But because we have tension there, what's going to happen is we're going to go see some sort of practitioner, and that practitioner is going to say, hey, it's tight over here. And you're going to say, loosen it. Oh, the worst words you could ever hear. Because if we say loosen it, it's kind of like I'm mean, pulling out those scissors and I'm going to go instead of, you know, 14.28 pounds, I'm going to cut another muscle, right? And now it's all of a sudden 16.67 pounds, right? And why do I use the appropriate math? So, you know, I'm right. And it's like, okay, there's 640 of these muscles, so it's not as bad as this scenario. But how do we get it better? Well, we get more muscles working and we get those muscles back online. And we don't do that dynamically do that through isometrics, right? There's a reason that historically isometrics lived in the world of rehab, right? Post-surgical intervention always starts with isometrics. It's safer, it's easier, it generates <clears throat> neuromuscular regeneration. So it means it helps regenerate the muscle structure, it helps regenerate the nerve structure. So if I can do that in an exercise session, that's awesome. But let's make Neil even better than perfect. So how do we get Neil handling less weight per muscle? Well, if we get more muscles working, right? So let's say Neil now has 20 muscles, right? Because Neil's doing some stuff. Well, now all of a sudden it's five pounds per muscle, right? So it kind of makes sense. I know that's math for people and nobody likes math, but you got to live there if you want to resolve issues, right? Because you can't just skirt the reality of bio, like, like really the mechanics and physics and then applied to muscle function, so... So you make it sound so simple, and I, I think it it is. <laughs> it is because I think you you have you're looking at it from a very different perspective. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know if it was something just innate or you you retrained your viewpoint. I'm not sure. We we have complicated this whole therapeutic to performance mindset. Right, and, and we're, because we're still searching for the answer, we just add more layers of complexity. We start making up jargon. It's like, well, let's, get just, let's just learn how to understand the basics. How do muscles contract? Cool, there's the, the chemical side, cool. We'll leave that in your realm. From a physical perspective, they create isometric muscle tension first. They pull in the tendon. Movement is a choice from that point on. And it's like, okay, cool. Now let's make it more complicated, mm -hmm. right? And you don't need to make it more complicated. You can live in that space and have extraordinary results. You don't have to have hypertension. We've helped numerous people get off medication, which there's no exit strategy when they put you on um, hypertension medication. For sure. Um, you know, what, 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 uh, to, to, speak, to, to speak on that specific uh, example with hypertension, what do you see is like, is there, is it related to relieving that tension on the arteries? Is it improving um, the, the uh, I guess, function of the, the limbs, the muscles? What, what's happening? What do you think is the... the so my highly um, read um, guesstimate, you know, because this still needs to be proven in the world of science and academia before it's touted as legitimate... Right, so when you're looking at the circulatory issue, right, let's, so let's break it down. So when you're looking at the circulatory system, you have your heart, you have your atrial side, and you have your venous side. Cool. 
So we have three things that we have to worry about, really just two, right? Your art, your heart theoretically works 100% of your life. And the reason I say theoretically is because I have guys who are clients who have zero function to their heart, and they actually live with an LVAD, which is left ventricular assist device, which is an external pump, wow. right? So guess what? You don't actually need a heart. I'm not saying go out and do it, but you don't need one. But we focus, if you think about how they measure hypertension, right? They go blood pressure. Cool. Very important statistic. And it's a bite, you know, vital to measure your vitals, as they say. And I totally support that. But we're looking at something, right? We're looking at the atrial side. That atrial side houses 35% of your blood volume. Your venous side houses 65% of your blood volume. And if I'm looking to correct something, I could look at my blood pressure. I could say, hey, let's take a pill and don't worry about actually fixing the other side of it. Well, that's not going to be so efficient or effective. Um, so if I can fix the 65% via isometric contractions, right? So if we get a muscle to contract better, it's going to help that return phase of blood flow, right? And we all theoretically know that it's governed by a muscle pump. So if I have muscles that are inactive or not optimal, I do not have an optimal circulatory system, right? And when you're looking at and approaching dynamic exercise, when you look at the activation rate of a muscle contraction in a dynamic realm, it functions at 89 or 88%. So if I'm losing 11% utility, why shouldn't I have a corrupt system? Why shouldn't I have an elevated system? Right? It has to work harder. But if I can all of a sudden increase the activation rate of that tissue by an extra 11%, and this is people that exercise, not the non-exercising people, which should, are usually even worse, right? this is a way that we can help restore it so that your heart doesn't have to work as hard. If I cause that better levels of compression at that shoulder joint, which we touched upon earlier, that artery, which I said, if you put it under stretch, that glenohumeral joint is going to narrow. If I take it off stretch, it's actually going to increase the diameter. It's going to increase the, the wall thickness instantly, not three weeks down the road. The studies will indicate it's instantly. They will also look at it and say, hey, the effect on the heart is within the first workout. They show positive results with isometrics. And then historically, they used to say isometrics is really bad for your heart. You, I have research going back to 1971 that says, well, it's less bad than cardio. You know, they just decided to promote cardio for whatever reason as a thing. What, what was the idea there? Why would they say isometrics are bad for your heart? Um, to be honest, I don't know why they, they, they gone down that road. I just, if I want to live in the world of conspiracy theory, well, if something fixes you so you're not in pain, it helps you move better, it lowers your blood pressure. Well, guess what? I don't have a patient. I don't have a client. Yeah. I don't make money. Um, and now, I'd hate to say that the pharmaceutical industry is evil. You hate to say it? I'd hate to say it because, <laughs> well, I don't want to get whacked. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, we'll just you know, so, But, yeah, you look at stuff like that, and you just, you just got to shake your head because there was a guy named Dr. Ronald Wiley in 1969 who was commissioned by the U.S. Air Force to actually elevate blood pressure in fighter pilots so they didn't black out under G-force. Um, so he found out in 1969 that doing non-dominant or isometrics – Grip strength, so squeezing the joystick, um, a control stick, whatever they call the thing to fly airplanes. Um, the pre-hypertensive, because you had to be pre-hypertensive to qualify as a pilot. What they found was, hey, a lot of these pilots are actually lowering their blood pressure. Well, that's not good for pilot training. Mm. So the study was an absolute failure for what they wanted for. Sure. And of course, he went on a 30 or 40 year tangent going, oh, well, let's prove that isometrics is great for lowering blood pressure. So a lot of the research stems from this guy named Dr. Ronald Wiley, who, to be honest, has gotten no credit over the history of the last 50 years. Um, and arguably, he should be one of the most influential research scientists in the history of mankind, as far as I'm concerned, because look at the epidemic with blood pressure. Here's a way that you can probably um, resolve it quite quickly if people knew how to do this stuff. Could you, would you say that if I practiced grip strength, I can lower my blood pressure? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the research will indicate better than any level of treadmill use. So how, how I mean, I, I know you, so the, the conversation somehow covered that, but like, how would I tell that to like a 
physician or I patient. Send, I, I, I send them the journal um, if it's a physician and say, hey, let's upskill your knowledge. You know, and it usually um, sometimes receptive, sometimes it's not. Yeah. Um, it depends on if they actually want to help people. And well, most physicians, I'm going to go, I, I'm going to err on the side of caution and say they do. Um, I, I, I have that belief because a lot of them are my clients because I used to collect them as clients because, uh, you know, as a, as a guy who grew up in a small town, uh, you know, doctors are, doctors are kings. Sure. And it's like, if, well, if I'm yeah. the guy educating the doctors. Well, then you're the king king. I'm the, I'm the king king. And then I also have the referral networks flowing up, right, because yeah. they would refer a lot of their clients. Well, that does make sense. And I mean, I think you did preface it by saying that these are people that want to learn because they want to help their patients. Want to. So it's interesting. So this brings up a, so I'm no longer really dealing with clients at all. And I get a phone call or actually an email the other day. And this lady, Harvard trained psychiatrist. So wicked smart. She was a professor at Harvard as well. So that, I mean, we're talking a level of smart that you would, most people um, don't even come close. So this lady goes, Hey, wanting to know if you can do me a favor. I'm like, sure, what? She goes, one of my acquaintances had a stroke and they had a stroke in August. And I want to lend them my isofit because she's a client of mine as well. And she's like, I want to lend them my isofit. I just want to see if, you, can you meet him first to see if this is appropriate for this gentleman? And this guy's name is Sarkis, and the guy is amazing. So he had a stroke August 15th. He was in a coma for 12 days. He didn't have basically visible function after he came out of his stroke um, for another sort of three weeks, four weeks. Um, and then he went through his rehab, and a lot of the people that helped him along the way did an extraordinary job. So, you know, kudos to them. But I meet him on Monday, and he, at this point, he is still in a wheelchair, doesn't have the confidence to walk. He hasn't had moved his um, right foot, or sorry, left foot, so his affected side since his stroke. He hadn't moved his left hand since his stroke. So since Monday of last week, so we've now been at this seven consecutive days. We increased his um, basically unsupported standing time 150%. So he went from two minutes to five minutes. He has moved his foot for the first time, and he has moved his hand for the first time. I haven't focused on his hand once and his foot, I would say almost, uh, I would say out of seven consecutive days of treatment and th really working out isometrically, I wouldn't even use the word treatment. Um, basically, we didn't focus on his foot either. So yet we were able to create the stability and strength within his structure where his nervous system is now able to move limbs he hadn't moved in a while. And he was bugging me the other day. He's like, hey, I know you say we're not going to work on your arm or work on my arm, but I, it's really important to me. I'm like, don't you worry about it. If your neck isn't functioning properly, if your core is not functioning properly, if your hips aren't functioning properly, your, your arm doesn't mean crap. You know, is it important? Yes. Optically, it, it, it bugs him. But since I told him not to worry about it, he's now moving it. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we stopped focusing on it. Because if you're not anchored properly, centrally i.e if you don't know how muscles truly work upregulation of isometric tension before all human movement right which would be your concentric recentric and that's instantaneous and that is at every specific joint degree right it's at a level of stupidness where you got to go down that rabbit hole and you got to understand how mechanics work and most people don't they just don't. They say, go move, keep doing this, and it slows down progress. I want to ask about um, the plank, yep. this, this idea. And, and for some reason of late, I've been hearing people complaining about causing more injuries than harm, uh, than benefit. But what are they doing something wrong? Usually not prepared for it. Um, so if you think about just the plank, it's usually used as an abusive tool. Right. So people's relationship with isometrics is either a plank or a wall sit. And it's true. Traditionally, it literally is abuse. Right. We're going to hold. We're going to suffer. I mean, I think the world record for plank is now seven hours. Um, so that's one way you could 
technically approach isometrics. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. I don't think there's any really any utility to that or value. Um, but specific to the plank, I mean, you have to think about that. If you're weak, right? So if you lack isometric strength and you just try to do a plank, that's a wickedly complex precision. Um, exercise. You have to worry about the, the forces going through your shoulder joint. You have to worry about shear force, which is a force going across structure, right? Think about all those vertebral bodies stacked together. Normally, when you walk around, they're stacked vertically. When you go to do a plank, it's now horizontal. Your body's horizontal to that ground. So you now introduce all these forces into a structure that are going down. And if I think about the facet joint at the backside, so you got your transverse processes and your spinous processes at those the vertebral bodies, right? So all of a sudden, let's say I don't have a perfectly aligned spine, right? Let's say I have a two degree rotation, right? So in that two degree rotation, I'm going to have, let's say it's rotated to the left. My left facet is going to jam harder than my right. It's going to gap a little bit on my right side jam a little bit on my left side. Yeah. So that plank, all of a sudden, which you thought was going to be good, is now screwing up a specific spinal level you didn't know the name of, you didn't consider, you didn't know the names of the muscles associated with it. Right? So it's like, let's regress even further, way, way, way back. Right? And then what do they usually say with a plank? Oh, do it for a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, a minute's a long time under a specific amount of load for usually somebody who's new to exercise. Sure. All right, so it's there's better ways to approach that. Like stand up against a wall, right? Maybe push your arms back into that wall to fire up your triceps. You know, maybe stand um, perpendicular to the wall and bring one leg out into that wall to work your hip structure, right? Stand facing away from the wall, bring your foot straight back to work your hamstring and your butt, right? So there's many different ways that we could approach isometrics differently that actually become a little bit more enjoyable and also more healthy for that individual. So what would be the feedback or the uh, recognition of improvement or excelling with isometrics, meaning is there a way that I can do something longer? Do I feel, what do I, 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 I want to understand like, like, cause you're using examples like pushing against a wall. Mm -hmm. So let's say you do that for like 45 seconds and then take, then stop and then do it again. You could. Um, so depending on the programming and stuff like that. So sure. now in the world of the um, youth, the sports minded, like the sports science guys, they got apparatus and equipment that you can measure all this stuff. Um, it gets kind of very expensive very quickly um, because it's gadgetry. And okay. so you can measure all your force output. So you can sort of track and uh, monitor progress. Um, I'm not a massive advocate for that for the general population. The reason for it is like, you know, it's an arbitrary guess at a specific joint angle. Um, so how is that really relevant to the grand scheme of things? Mm -hmm. If you're able to do a trillion things and I measure 73, it's really a spec on the, the grand scheme of life. Um, and I may try to inform you based off that spec. And I might be so blatantly wrong, I lead to injury. Yeah. Um, you know, and accelerate that risk. So the, the, what we use as a measure traditionally is, hey, how do you feel, right? Um, are you moving better? Did that connection, you know, do you feel that increase in tone? And most people, when they do an isometric, within the first three workouts, will notice a significant difference in how they're moving and how they're feeling and how they're functioning, right? So it's, it sounds like it's, I'm promising the world, but that's just straight out of the literature, and it's like, oh, okay, well, if I can sort of just hang my hat off the science, and this was a piece of literature that came from York University, so just up the street from where we are right now, and that's going back to 2008, so it's not like it's recent, but it's like, okay, well, if this is how a muscle works, and if I do this level of contraction, um, and it's going to increase my torque production, so how I generate motion, 12 workouts over one month, it had 180 repetitions per week, right? So not a lot. Increase the torque production by 46%. So if I can generate 46% more torque, I generate more power, I can respond to more things, most likely my structure is not going to fall apart, right? It's going to become tighter, right? And so, I think tighter is a good word for sure. everyone out there. Is that something 
someone someone can feel tighter. You yeah. can look potentially. You can look kind of tighter with yeah. your physique. Because I, I think a lot of times people get caught up with like, hype, like whether it's inches on a bicep or uh, their their skeletal muscle mass when we mm-hmm. do like their bioimpedance or whatever gaining mass versus losing fat. So th- there's a lot of th- I guess constructs of what we look at in terms of fitness and strength that they kind of mask and they kind of put a very nice glossy finish on something that maybe is compromised structurally. Well, it's it. So when I was back training, so as I said, I like to collect people and audiences specifically to see if I can add value to their life. So we had Canada's top modeling agency sending us a ton of their talent in order to do rapid, basically transformations, right? Because we all know that muscles burn calories, right? Nobody's going to argue that. It's like, oh yeah, we, muscles burn calories. It's like a badge of honor. Cool. Well, if I'm activating your muscle at hundred percent and traditional exercise is only 80, 88 or 89%, who's going to burn more calories? And when you start to look at it and you go, okay, when the science will indicate that 30 seconds of maximum isometrics, and this this study was specific to the vastus lateralis muscle, so the muscle on the outside of your leg. So they looked at 30 seconds of maximum isometrics to 30 seconds of maximum sprinting. On a per muscle basis, they burned near similar calorically, the caloric output. Mm -hmm. Sprinting was a little bit more, but sprinting is really hard and you can't do that usually for 45 seconds at a high intensity. And the reason for that is the muscle in an isometric is working the entire time. During a sprint, it's working a proportionate period of time, right? So you have some muscles in sprinting. All of these muscles are working in unison doing one thing or the other. In an isometric, if you just instruct the person first foremost to breathe, never hold your breath with doing an isometric, but then t- tighten everything, well, then you're doing, well, basically those 640 muscles you might not know the names of. Well, if you're t- trying to tighten everything, there's a high probability most of those muscles are tightening, mm-hmm. right? So you're burning this not just on a singular muscle, yeah. you're now burning on a global perspective, yeah. right? And the more muscle tone that you have, right, that tension within your structure. So post like exercise, you're going to be burning more calories as well because as you increase that tone or that contraction of that muscle, it's going to shorten and it's going to get stronger. So it generates more force consistently. So then your tendon is going to be pulled on. And now here's where that cascading effect, what we were talking about earlier, gets really cool. That tendon forms the outer surface of your bone, right? It's called your periosteum, right? So it forms that periosteum of that bone. And if I can increase that tension on that periosteum, I'm going to reduce the likelihood you end up with things like osteoarthritis, or sorry, not osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, Mm -hmm. right, over the course of your life. I'm going to reduce fall risk. I'm going to increase transmission of force because I get a stronger bone, a stronger tendon, and a more compliant muscle and better nervous system. There was something earlier, the metabolic rate. So does isometrics increase your basal metabolic rate? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Does that also increases blood flow to adipose tissue? Sure. Right, which is great because normally what happens during a muscle contraction when you're not holding it and sustaining it, um, basically you have the perfusion, so the blood will go in and out of the tissue. When you're doing a sustained isometric, basically it's like putting up a roadblock, and you know my brain says, "Hey, send oxygen to this working muscle," and it's got to be a durational hold. It can't just be five seconds. It's got to be like forty-five seconds or greater. So what will happen is if you're keeping that muscle s- contraction sustained, it runs into this sort of roadblock. It gets diverted from the muscle structure. It goes into local adipose tissue. And what some of the research will indicate, there's nearly a seven hundred percent increase in blood flow into that adipose tissue. And if you're looking at sort of an obese population and metabolic conditions, usually what happens is there's basically a reduction of blood flow into that area. So if we can magnify that by 700%, that's insane. It is. And you had mentioned you must be breathing. Yes. Is that part of it? Hells yes. Don't hold your breath. Uh, It just cuts off blood supply to your brain and increases your likelihood of a stroke. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's wickedly uh, important to breathe. And that could just be talking. It could be counting. It could be singing or just basically just don't hold your breath. Um, yeah. Cause a lot of people just innately hold their breath when they do something. Yeah. So a lot of the, a lot of the research, if we jump back to the seventies when they were doing it, um, because we lived in a world of, um, you know, purists, 
Um, mm. You would have to hold your breath so not to displace your rib cage, <clears throat> right? So that way there was no movement in that muscle mm. as opposed to eh, if it moves a little bit. Like, so how I define an isometric would be, you know, a, a muscle contraction with little to no visible joint movement. The muscle actually moves in an isometric. It actually can shorten by 16%, mm -hmm. right? So it's, I don't need to do dynamic exercise because I can shorten the muscles 16% and relax and contract and relax and contract. Right? It's like when you're, you know, well, the sport of bodybuilding. I know Neil at some point in time used to love bodybuilding, used to hang out with all these guys. I remember photos of you and Jay Cutler. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the king bodybuilders of all mm -hmm. times. They're the sport of isometrics, right? They get up there and flex. And you know, talk to any bodybuilder flexing for periods of time and having to sustain that contraction is awful right you know they usually introduce the flexing uh, the the posing routine portion six to eight weeks before the show right in conjunction with their diet well that's when they lose all their weight right so yeah. is it the reduction of calories the answer is yes is it the magnification of caloric expenditure through isometrics i was going to ask you if the flexing yeah. practice was actually what was it's going to contribute. Yeah. Um, is it the end all and be all? It definitely helps. Yeah. Right? Cause we see that with um, some of our obese people that we work with. Um, we had one guy and this is through one of our ISOFIT owners in um, Connecticut. So he had this uh, basically a very, very large individual and he instructed the guy to do one minute of isometrics. Right, so basically a forward flex of his spine, lateral flex, spinal extension, and opposite side. Um, so in a month, the guy lost 14 pounds, right? Just by doing one minute of isometrics a day, he felt great. Um, you know, our isofit owner didn't really think much of the, like, yeah, we'll give it to him, we'll see where it's gonna go. You know, I just listened to Brad at a course, Brad said that this would help, so he threw it out to the guy. And basically, all parties, um, including myself, extremely excited at the result the guy had because it instilled confidence. It gave him the knowledge necessary to execute on a, a desired outcome. And to be honest, I don't think he believed that this would lead to something, mm -hmm. right? What's one minute of exercise going to actually do for somebody? Well, when you once again explore the science, 60 seconds of isometrics is going to be equivalent, you know, basically what, three and a half minutes kind of or six minutes sorry not three and a half minutes um so six times so it's kind of like okay well if for every one minute i get six minutes of benefit mm -hmm. well, that's pretty damn cool sure right yeah. um, my math is off it's a hundred it's basically one hour it's basically 30 minutes equals um you know three hours so what's my math on that you know having six a six times yeah yeah five or five or six times greater yeah. right so which is kind of interesting so if we can magnify that you know contraction to equal a three hour workout, right? And I recommend people do 30 minutes of isometric six days a week. Mm -hmm. So you're basically getting 18 hours worth of benefit with giving up three hours, yeah. right? Yeah. And when you look across the board and I said, okay, well, normally speaking to cover off six weeks of exercise, if I can, if I can compress that into a week, now I go four weeks out. So I basically got 24 weeks of benefit in a month. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the unrealistic result we traditionally see. Yeah, because you just maximize efficiency. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Kegel exercises. Yeah, kings of isometrics. They don't know that, though. I know. That's what I th came I to mind as you were talking. Yeah. All right. So we've been using this. Oh, man, I did a talk on... Uh, what is this? Well, the last name's Kegel, doctor, but I forget what I forget his name and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so so for like, I don't know, 40, 50 years now, women have been well, women and men for incontinence and stuff like that, basically using isometrics to basically help with their, you know, function. Yeah. So well, I mean, I was speaking to um a sales rep and he's representing a, a company that they have a device, it's I think about hundred and fifty thousand dollars that it kind of simulates a thousand, multiple thousands of contractions uh, in a few, uh, maybe a half an hour treatment. It's a, it's, I don't want to say it's a glorified tens machine, but mm -hmm. it's something to that effect. Uh, and there's a, a certain kind of rhythm and programming that goes into it. And it's supposed to help with uh, incontinence, men and women, all that sort of thing, uh, even sexual function. Um, so, I mean, that's where I'm like, what if 
just like the true Kegel, like, because I know there's all people who are like physiotherapists that do uh, pelvic floor rehab uh, and also just the idea of like coaching someone on Kegels. So is there, is there more to it than just strengthening the muscle? Well, there's the neurological adaptation to the muscle. So by doing the isometric or by doing the Kegel, right? Yeah. So we'll, we'll bring it back to my world. So by doing the isometric contraction, it's going to enhance that nerve relationship to that area. So it's going to become more taut, right? So it's going to improve the, 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 the function of all of the muscles participating. Right. And when you're looking at sort of the pelvic floor, I mean, I think there's 13 muscles offhand. I might be forgetting some of the like the principal ones. Um, so if I'm able to sort of contract those tissues and get them neurologically functioning, right, you know, where we talked about, you know, those strings that we we're talking about, those muscles. Well, if I just add more strings, more muscles to the, the conversation, stress on the whole system goes down. Function is going to increase. Right. And if you think about, let's go above the pelvis. If I did, you know, Kegels for my abs, right, isometrics for my abs, maybe my GI tract is going to be held in a better spot. Maybe the function, the peristalsis of all the stuff, it's under less stress, sure. right? Because it's held together the way it's supposed to be. Blood flow is going to improve. You know, if I'm looking at my colon, if I'm looking at my intestines, if I have tissues not contracting properly well it's basically a free-for-all in there mm -hmm. if i increase the tension of my you know transverse abdominis my rectus abdominis my internal external oblique and there's this muscle called your pyramidalis which most people never even heard of right that holds basic cinches down on your linea alba mm -hmm. right so that's going to anchor everything so if you don't know what this is what a, it's a small little muscle it sits about two centimeters below your umbilicus or your uh, your belly button and it basically looks like a tent so it actually pulls your pubic symphysis tighter together if you think about the other side of your pubic symphysis you have your si joint mm -hmm. so for a lot of people out there with si joint dysfunction you can actually help resolve that by tightening the muscles in your front to take the stress off the muscles on your back sure right because it's just a bowl right if you actually think about the pelvic structure so some things that once again jump down that rabbit hole of anatomy and muscle function and how do you engage this stuff better right where where's the role in diet or supplementation in relation to isometrics personally i don't talk about it ever at not my realm not to say it's not important but it's not my world right well i mean the idea that's coming to mind is like how do we how can we help support strengthening uh, of the tendon? I will leave that to you. All right. And, and the reason I don't talk about it, I'm not skilled. I'm not schooled in that area. Um, and also, I just see everyone gets better. So regardless of what their diet or Kinda supplementation, is, yeah. does it make a difference? Yeah. What we've seen with our 30 and 30 program, I tell them not to change their diet. I tell them not to do cardio. I tell them not to lift weights. Don't do anything outside the ordinary. Just add this. Mm -hmm. um, in a month, and this is going every day for a month, uh, we on average see about 15 pounds of weight loss or 15 hours of exercise. So we're losing a pound basically without diet modification at all. Um, we had one lady by the name of Marianne, and she was down in Mexico. So she took us up. She did 22 days consecutive, so 11 hours. She lost three dress sizes. Wow. Right? And you'd look at that and you go, oh. And one of the things that, and the reason I don't talk about diet, I'm trying to fix one thing. When I start throwing in all this other stuff, I just made it complex all to hell right? Um, I don't care if you smoke. Like, yes, I do. I obviously don't smoke. Brad said to smoke. I said to smoke. <laughs> I can make an argument saying it's good for your cardiovascular health, if you will. Um, you know, just based on elevating your hyper, like heart rate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to use heart rate as a measuring stick, it does unfortunately make your arteries harder though. So it's a, it's a conflicting thing. Cigarettes. Um, I Cigarettes. can give a personal experience. I don't know if you remember, but back, uh, must be 20 years ago, like this is how long our friendship's gone on, but I remember I got into, I uh, got really into a really bad accident. Someone hit me, a kid hit me from behind in my mm -hmm. car and I ended up uh, going to a physiotherapist and they didn't really help me at all. And then I, I better called you up and then fixed me within a week. 
Yeah. And I had a dragging leg. Remember, I was like, yeah. I had my one leg. I can't remember which one it was, but the one side just wouldn't connect. I couldn't get the flow going. Yeah. And it felt like I was like dragging my one leg behind me. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was astounding. I didn't think it would get that fast, but he fixed it in like a couple of days or a week or something like that. Yeah. It, it didn't take very long. Right. And what it just comes back to let's just, we got to explore the basics. Right. And this is why, you know, with our, um, Sarkis, the, the gentleman who had the stroke, it's, you know, we're, we're a week in. My expectation is um, that I would have him walking better. You know, we didn't achieve that in a week, but I just have unrealistic goals where it's like, okay, cool. Where, and the reason I base that off of some of the other people I've worked with strokes before where we did have them walking better in a week, but they were in a different condition. They walked in. We just had them walking better. They weren't wheelchair bound. But one thing that we do um, consistently as a species is we make things complicated. We add layers upon layers upon layers. What is the initial goal? You want stronger tendons? Cool. Do this. Do you want a better circulatory system? Do this. Do you want better muscle function? Do this. Now, subsequently, you can achieve all of that through isometrics. As opposed to, hey, you have to learn how to orchestrate this movement pattern. You have to pick a weight. You have to select the right weight. You have to learn how to breathe properly as opposed to just breathe. right? So exercise as a whole, the way that we recommend people do it, is so complex and requires so much skill, it has turned people off of exercise. Mm -hmm. right? If you look at how many people, and this is URSA, so the International health and racket and sports association so the world's leading governing body in exercise world be it north america um, and most of the world according to them basically i think it's 80 percent of the population does not have a gym membership so 20 percent of america has a gym membership and out of those 20 percent of the people that have a membership less the, their average visitation to the gym every week is less than twice Right. And that's the average. So you got you guys that go all the time and you got you guys that basically have a membership to feel good about themselves. But you look at that and you go, OK, cool. So if 80 80 percent of the population hasn't bought in to exercise is good for you, maybe we need to change how we're approaching it because clearly we're failing. We're at an epidemic level for you pick a topic. We're at an epidemic level outside of good fitness. Sure. Right. And it's like, I know that flies in the face of conventional wisdom. And I'm not saying don't exercise. I'm just saying if you change how you exercise, you can A, reintroduce it back to your life. You can get it to where it's actually generating a health outcome instead of an hindrance outcome. Because I know, like, as you get over 30 and you get into your 40s and 50s and 60s, the more you exercise, the more money you spend on therapy. Like, that's ridiculous. Um, and I know you got a lot of therapists listening to you, your audience, so I do apologize for you know cutting off your uh, livelihood. If they're good therapists, <laughs> they would want to know how to help their patients. I know, right? So, and we want those people to call me because I'm happy to help. I think they will. I hope so. I'm glad I spoke to you. Because uh, and we'll uh, talk eyes again. Eyes open today, so especially on this topic, because I don't think anyone really knows about. It. They don't. Ex they don't explore it the way I do. Like anyone. This is very like. This will open people's eyes because it's it's functional, it's straightforward, uh, it it's addressing an area of fitness that ninety nine percent of people just completely overlook in terms of like exercise physiology. Yeah. What's it? What what's the muscle? We we say muscle, but it's not just the muscle. No, and that's part of the, I guess, the brainwashing. Yep. Because it's like we just talk about muscles and then we're ignoring all the other things. Well, it's also the word strength. Yeah. Right? Like this word is, you know, important in several aspects. But if I mention the word strength, you think movement, right? The bias is such that you would never consider if my goal was strength to not move, to pull into something that doesn't move. But yet, if my goal is strength, isometric training absolutely crushes, absolutely crushes dynamic exercise for an improvement of strength. It's not even close. It's actually about 200% greater for isometrics. Like it's over double, right? And all you have to do is just try it. You'll believe it as soon as you do it, right? And the people that I work with, 
you know, they, their, their eyes that become wider opened because they're like, um, I didn't expect this. Well, you just never tried it. And that's all I can say to people is until you try it, until you actually have a relationship with a better muscle contraction, you're going based off of previous sort of uh, belief, experience, and everything else. And that's why most people don't continue exercising because they unfortunately had a really bad experience as a kid exercising. Or even an adult. Or, or even an adult. Yeah. And as a trainer, like my, my background as a trainer, like it's, it's simple and easy too. Like it's not like it's really that complicated. Yeah. So people can do it you know, at home. They can do it at, at the clinic, at your clinic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, use a wall. I mean, that's what ISOFIT is. It's a fancy wall that I brought into the middle of a room. It's kind of like, you know, some of the history of exercise equipment with a lot of people don't realize a treadmill is just outside, inside. Yeah. So I didn't have to worry yeah. about the environmental conditions, right? A guy named Bill Stubb and um, what's the guy's name? Uh, Kenneth Cooper brought out that in, I guess, uh, mid-60s. And then from there, you know, Stairmaster, same thing. It's just staircase, mm -hmm. right? Step mill, revolving yeah. staircase. <laughs> You know, a spin bike, yeah. I mean, a guy named uh, Johnny Goldman got hit by a car. He was an avid sort of uh, road cyclist and got hit by a car and, you know, had uh, some phobia about going back out there. So he created an indoor trainer, which became the spin bike. I mean, it's absolutely genius. You know, just the, the innovation in the exercise industry with the goal of helping people traditionally also making money. So, I mean, there is that side over there. You know, and we fill in a gap. We basically are the prequel to all dynamic movement. Where do you start? This is your opening segment. This is your story. This is how better function and better health and reduce injury starts. But you can't start in the middle of the book, you know, and expect to really understand how this works. And that's how we promote exercise. Mm -hmm. They just say, just go move. It's like, but I'm not prepared, right? And that's across the board. Everyone that I know, including myself, has been injured at some point because they tried to exercise. I'm going to wrap, but I wanted to do a contrast because it keeps coming to my mind, the Bowflex. Great product. Because it's, it, how how synergistic is it with the isometric? Because, I mean, I know you can adjust the tension. Depending on how you use it, right? So if you were to do an isometric against the Bowflex, let's say you're just going to, you know, pick a weight, you know, obviously they have their power rod technology or now they have their really cool like spinny disc things. Mm -hmm. um, and the cool thing is, so I studied under the bow, like the, the pitch man for Bowflex, so a guy named Tom Purvis. So he was actually my mentor. So I studied directly under him. So he was the pitch man for Bowflex, for, I think 16 years. Mm -hmm. So well-versed in product um, and the understanding of the mechanics of it. I mean, it's a genius product for what it is. And they sold over $7 billion. So, you know, kudos to them. And, you know, they transformed a lot of lives. So let's put all that credential over here and say, to say, okay, cool. What's wrong with Bowflex? Um, if you're prepared for it, nothing. If you're not prepared for it, it's just like any other product out there where it has more risk. So let's say in an isometric, and you did open up a, 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 an interesting topic, there's multiple ways you can do isometrics. There's holding isometrics, right, which would call it be basically holding isometric muscle action, which would be called HEMA, and there's a PEMA, which is a pushing or pulling isometric muscle action. So if I'm holding something in space, and that has a mass, and I start to get tired, that functions the same as holding that heavy dumbbell. The risk goes up. Yeah. If I'm pushing into the isofit, risk goes down, right? As I fatigue, because it just it's Newton's third law of motion, or what we've dubbed force matching technology. So certain aspects about the Bowflex, it's focused on dynamic exercise or dynamic movement traditionally. So it's no different than you know the base level of Pilates the traditional gym exercise, weight lifting. I mean, they're just manipulating different resistance sources. And that's all it is. I mean, it's functionally inside. You can argue that like rubber bands have different physiological properties. So you can reduce things like inertia, which is the consequence of accelerated motion, right? That's good. Dumbbell, if I shove on a dumbbell, it still keeps going. You know, so there's different sort of health benefits to different materials. Uh, but that's wicked complicated. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just learn how to do isofit, push into something that 
doesn't push back, or sorry, it does push back, but it doesn't push back and it's not going to take you into position that you aren't prepared to go. Matches where you're at. 100% of the time. And it changes in real time as well. So if you push harder, it gives you more. If you push less, it pushes less. If you just fatigue, it changes too, right? So it, it's just a safer, more effective, and more efficient way to exercise. And that's it. Cool. I love it. It's Thank you, was, Brad. That was fantastic. It's been an absolute blast. Thank and you, Neil. To the Thank audience, you. thank you guys for listening and hopefully you uh, kind of picked up some stuff and, you know, all of those things. I will put everyone's socials and contacts in the, um, wherever I'm posting this, I'll be posting across social media. Um, thank you again, guys. This was fantastic. Thank you. I'd love to talk in the future. Absolutely. And maybe have someone else. I, I, I want to bring someone else not to do a counterpoint, but to, you know, someone who has... We've we've broached this topic slightly, but you totally blew through the wall, and we'll yeah. just keep going. Happy to talk to anybody. I mean, at the end of the day, what I know holds true. Um, you know, and if we're able to sort of help bring light to somebody else, absolutely. I like it. Yeah. Thank All you. right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.